Welcome and thank you for joining us for this morning's live panel discussion which forms part of the Data Centers Island Virtual Festival. My name's Hugh Robinson, I'm the Exhibition Director for Data Centers Island, which cannot be physically held due to the pandemic this year, but will take place next year on the 16th and 17th of November 2021 at the RDS in Dublin. Data Centers Island Virtual Festival consists of live panel discussions, two per day over the course of this week, featuring industry leaders and experts discussing key areas affecting data centers, both in Ireland and internationally. As well as the live panel discussions, the festival also has a range of on-demand content, which can be accessed through the Data Centers Island website. This morning's session is entitled, Retrofitting Legacy Data Centers, and features an exceptional panel of experts. If you would like to ask any questions, please put them in the chat box and they shall be addressed at the end of the discussion. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the Data Centers Island website as additional on-demand content. Today's moderator for this morning's panel discussion is Brian Dotty, Managing Director and CEO of Atlantic Hub. So without further ado, I shall hand you over to Brian. Brian. Thank you very much, Hugh. And uh, thank you for uh, the privilege of being the moderator for this session. Uh, welcome everybody, uh, those joining from uh, Ireland and beyond and, and uh, other shores. Uh, particularly uh, pleased to welcome our four guests panelists today. Uh, Gary Watson, uh, Country Manager of uh, Keppel Data Centers. Uh, Joe McCaffrey, Managing Director of Duke McCaffrey. Eddie Clavan, Chief Executive of Dataplex Group. And to Frank Grunholm, Vice President of Global HVCATR for, of Sales for ABB uh, motion and uh, I think we have a very excellent uh, panel but before we progress might I say uh, a big thank you and compliments to Hugh and Kirsten and his team uh, for persevering uh, through recent months uh, of the pandemic like the rest of us but particularly Hugh uh, and your team who have been used to putting this on in uh, a real uh, environment in Dublin uh, over recent years where we had uh, uh, exceptionally good times and uh, very productive sessions in Dublin at the RDS in recent years, but to persevere uh, through the challenges and to present Data Centers Ireland now online, I think is a great uh, achievement. And I think uh, a great thank you uh, to Hugh and your team for that. So um, that's the general introductions over. Uh, we were we feel that uh, it, we have an opportunity for some uh, excellent uh, topics to be discussed today and for you, the audience as well, we hope you find them interesting. And uh, we're gonna look at uh, capacity constraints, power efficiencies. We're gonna look at how we can uh, discuss what retrofitting a legacy data center all means, and particularly what it means to you, the audience and participants today, and uh, those areas that may be of particular interest to you and your business, either in current challenges or planning for the future. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a, a, a number of questions and topics, and we're gonna start uh, in no particular order, but I think Gary Watson, you're first on, on the list. Mm. Uh, and, and Gary, the question I have for you is, uh, how often is a retrofit preferable to a new build, for example? Okay, um, good morning, everybody. Um, interesting question, because I, I don't personally feel that they're comparable, Brian. Um, okay. You know, <clears throat> so especially with the, the way the, the industry is uh, changing, over the over the past number of years so you know the demands um, and the end users are changing somewhat so you know we're looking at when we're looking at a legacy data center we're looking at the clients that are already existing within the facilities and the longevity of the facility and um, to maintain uh, maintain the, the facility there for a number of a uh, number more years um, that doesn't necessarily lend itself to some of the clients um, that we are seeing, obviously across the globe. Um, a lot, of, a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, take up, as we know, is being taken by hyperscalers, um, where you know a lot of the legacy data centers nowadays, you know, would have maybe maximum 10, 10 megawatts on a site potentially. Um, and smaller data centers. So they have more of a, I, I'd say they have more of a, a niche market now than actually being there to, to actually um, deliver, um, deliver the, the larger requirements from certain hyperscale 
hard to scale clients across the, across the globe. So, so realistically, uh, realistically, Brian, you know, the, the data centers have their own niche in the digital ecosystem right now. Um, but will they, uh, can you compare them with building a new one? Um, you have to protect your current revenue as an operator um, within your, in your facility and your portfolio. Um, you know, you're not necessarily going to, well, you can't uh, turn up and turn the data center off and lift and shift all your clients. Uh, clients overnight, one, it's not good for business. It's not good for their business. Um, so they're, they're not really, not really comparable to be perfectly honest. Okay. okay. Anybody else any comments on the panel on that? So for ourselves, for Datapex, we, we, we take a different track. Um, we look at data centers that have been used by either banks or, or, or institutes that are no longer uh, using them because they've, they've migrated their, uh, their compute to, or most of their computers to cloud and they need a lot less real estate. So uh, if you take the UK, we're looking at a, um, a two, two facilities there, one in Liverpool, which was a former uh, bank data center. Um, and as Gary said, you know, things have changed in the last 10 years uh, for what clients need and what they want. Uh, what we were seeing in Iraq, you know, 15 years ago, two to three kilowatts a uh, rack has now gone from eight to 12 to 16 kilowatts a rack. So what we're trying to do is we're looking at those old footprint sizes that were uh, traditionally seven to 10 kilowatts, sorry, megawatts in terms of footprints, and then looking to see how we can double the power capacity on site. We are looking at new technologies of uh, on-chip cooling to bring the server uh, rack up to up to 24 and 40 kilowatts. Uh, we have a couple of trials running at the moment in Ireland uh, on that. Um, and again, th th that's information and, and, and white papers we're sharing with the hyperscalers. We do see that footprint is, is going to become less um, and compute is going gonna, is gonna to be more in a smaller footprint. Uh, so we are looking at 20 uh, megawatts in terms of our footprint for our sites. Uh, but we're, we're doing that in a, a footprint that traditionally was 7 to 10 kilowatts. Uh, sorry, megawatts, not kilowatts, megawatts. Okay. Just because of the density of the, the, the racks that the clients are using there. Exactly. So you're going to increase power density where you can, Eddie? Yeah, but as, as uh, like Gary, we're, we're only looking at it with completely empty data centers. We, we don't have any customers in there. We have nothing in there. We're taking the original shell. So that ticks the number of boxes. So the site has already got planning for data centers. There's already a, a very large power connection in there. So there's a lot already there established that we can then just embellish them by putting in, uh, taking out the raised floor element, putting in solid floors, uh, overhead containment, overhead uh, buzz bar, um, and then retrofitting it then to the new designs that the clients are looking for. And it is that hyperscale market that everyone's <laughs> focusing on. Um, and it is really looking at their needs and what they're, you know, the location that they're looking for um, uh, to, to, to drive that forward. Uh, but it's only empty data centers for us. So, so <clears throat> there will be client participants today in the audience who perhaps have different uh, uh, positions currently where some may, may well have a, a data center that's at capacity and are considering a retrofit to, to increase power density, increase efficiency, uh, and have maybe are looking at an option to, to do a new build. Uh, so really, what do we say to those people who, you know, unlike the, 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 uh, the uh, locations you're talking about, Eddie, where uh, there's no existing client base, for those, for those clients who have a large uh, capacity at the moment, uh, do we say, yeah, you, you should consider retrofit or if you have an opportunity to move to a new location, do so? I, I think it, historically, any of the banks were just got off building brand new. They weren't, they weren't touching their existing footprint and they were just building brand new. And that's the, the, the market that we're seeing is that because they've bought, built brand new high density, they're now, you know, they, they don't want their old um, low density uh, facilities anymore. And that's where okay. we're, that, that, that's the market we're picking up in. So we are seeing those guys doing it. I'm not sure if the hyperscalers are ready to, to, to offload what they've already built um, and build brand new. Um, I'd say because of their footprint and their exposure, they're probably able to take a building down completely, retrofit it and bring it back into their estate. But uh, I, I don't okay. know as a fact. Joe, any comments, Joe? Yeah, like there's, there's a big ethical question really about new build, uh, particularly for data center providers who are power hungry and uh, there's a whole sustainability issue that needs to be addressed. The huge amount of industrial buildings uh, around Ireland but throughout Europe that are just lying idle um, and 
in construction, most of the carbon release is through the concrete, the steel, uh, the, the, the panels. That's where the big carbon release is in construction. Uh, so the, there's a whole kind of ethical sustainability question that data center operators and providers have to to ask uh, and utilize these industrial buildings that are perfect, absolutely perfect for, for data center use. Uh, so there's a very real question. Um, what, why would you go and build a new building uh, on greenfield sites? Uh, around green belts in most cities uh, when there's perfect industrial units lying empty uh, and very often you can get power to them, no problem. So it's a big, big, big question for, for, for big data data operators to, to, to respond to that. Okay. I think the challenge there is the, is the fiber connectivity, you know, um, and I know fiber now is unrepeatable at 140 kilometers or whatever, but mm. that's always been the challenge. So it, it's, it's about, you know, getting that balance just because, you know, no matter if you, you know, if you build a brand new data center in the middle of nowhere, if you don't have fiber to it, uh, or you have the wrong type of fiber, it's still a shed, you know, so, you know, unfortunately, there is a lot of industrial units, not so much in Ireland, I mean, certainly across Europe, uh, you know, uh, where we're working in northern uh, in the northwest of the UK, there's a lot of a uh, lot of real estate there that's been um, been, been left vacant for a long time. So they're the locations we're looking at, but we're only doing that because there's fiber coming to the area, and we couldn't look at it before. There's a new fiber, dark fiber ring getting built around the whole of uh, that Liverpool northwest area, um, and if it wasn't there, we wouldn't be there. And there must be 200 buildings which were, as you say, Joe, would be suitable for the hyperscalers for their for their business, but without that fiber. It's a non-runner, so there has to be that balance, you know. Frank, what's your view? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the, I mean, we talk a lot about the the increasing of capacity in existing data centers as one of the drivers for for a retrofit, and that is that is true. But one of the things you need to realize is you have to actually plan a retrofit when you when you're looking at increasing capacity as well, in the same way as you would plan new, because you need to look all the way at your power infrastructure as well. <laughs> What is your what is your backup generator capacity? What are your transformer dimensions? What types of loads do you have on already today? And what types of load do you plan to have on in the future? Where, I mean, if you look at a genset, essentially, if you have a, a six pulse standard drive on it running your cooling systems, you have to fit, derate the gensets by 50%. Now you can just change the drives and retrofit those and that would give you more capacity on your gen sets because with new technologies, active front end solutions, you can actually eliminate the requirement for derailing, increasing available capacity on your gen sets. So, so with the right level of planning, you can do some retrofits, but you need to plan it all the way from the power source into the data center, your cabling, your wiring, because the harmonic distortion that you get from a six pulse drive actually increases the heating on your cable. So if you have to increase your your cooling system and you still use six pulse drives, then you increase the heating on the cables. Can they even carry the load? So 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 there's a there's I'll be coming there. I'll be I'll be straight there. Thank you. Okay. You make a very good point, Frank. And in fact, you, you, it's an interesting point to bring on to my next question, which I'll 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 put to you if you don't mind. And that is sure. is it reasonable to consider a retrofit in absence of increased facility power? capacity so you know you're sitting in an existing building uh, yeah. you're considering a retrofit but guess what you can't increase the power capacity to the facility what do you do uh, and that that of course depends a lot on what what is the equipment that you have on already um, it, like i said if you've got old legacy drives just replacing those essentially can release maybe up to 20 percent of the power capacity on your on your input power and with that, you can then suddenly start looking at where do I want to then use that power? You're still not pulling more power from the utility, but you're increasing the capacity on the transformers. And you're increasing that by, by reducing the noise disturbances in your system. Now suddenly you've got some flexibility, but I mean, if you need to double the capacity, no, you need more power in there. There's no way you can double capacity. If you just need to have a buffer because you're running at the edge and you, you think, well, I can probably stay here for another three to five years if I could just get this 10, 20% buffer. Yes, that would be feasible. So it depends also on, well, if you want to scale up, how much do you actually need to scale up? So, so again, it's a, it's a full project view that's necessary when you look at it, both in the short term, but also in the long term, because otherwise you're gonna run into trouble as soon as you get started. And then you've already 
some cost that you need to take into consideration, and that would be a shame. So, Eddie, can I put to you then uh, uh, what, what Frank has just said? Would you consider a retrofit where you don't have any additional power capacity? In other words, you're just going to try and increase efficiency uh, and reduce costs potentially of operational costs? Only if I've got a customer, and it's all about customers. If you don't have a client, then no is the short answer. Uh, yeah. So, it, it, you know, it, it, it is all, it, it's all about the economics. Um, you know, it's the cost of ownership, it's the cost of uh, doing the development. And without a customer paying for it at the end of it, then uh, I wouldn't speculatively go off and do that. I'd need to see that someone's looking to do that. <laughs> you know, um, we're so, you know, and, and, and again, you know, you, you've got to look at each project individually. But if you're looking to try and do something to attract the hyperscalers, then, as Gary said at the beginning, it's got to be the sort of 20 megawatt sort of footprint that you've got to be aiming for to, yeah. to attract them uh, in terms of what their requirements are. You yeah. are finding some niche um, companies that are still out there who yeah. still need their own compute, their own storage, their own uh, DDoS protections, etc. And so they are looking for the, you know, the, tw the two to, to four megawatt type footprints. And they are, they are out there. Uh, but there's less and less of them out there because, you know, everything is migrating as much as you can to the cloud. Um, and it's those cloud platforms that we're after them. So um, okay. uh, no is the short answer. If it's my own money, yes, if there's a customer. But you, so, sorry, Brian, but you, you do have to look at the, the you know, the, <clears throat> the data center organization as well, Brian. So we don't want to get confused like Eddie's saying that he's going out, he's locating Shell and Core on fiber and retrofitting it. Um, but there's, you know, like ourselves here in Pepple or our, our peers in, in Equinix and Interaction and so on, you know, we, we built data since 15 years ago, 17 years ago, 20 years ago, right? They still farm or still form, sorry, part of the overall portfolio that service current customers. So you're still going through a whole process of, you know, maintaining the operational side of the business and delivering production environments for your own clients. Correct, yeah. Yeah, you really then have to look at the business case where you're protecting your current clients, you're protecting your current revenue, right? And then look at what you need to do because, you know, 15, 10, 15, 20 years ago, these data centers. You know, I know we use a PUE very flippantly sometimes, but, you know, PUE of 2.2. You know, you build a new data center nowadays, you're looking at 1.0 to 1.1, you know, right right down there. But, you know, you still got to drive that total cost of ownership and give back as, as you know, power costs increase. You still, need to drive, you still need to drive a lot of efficiencies within your own, within your own business and therefore passing them on to, on to your own client. And, and that, and, and that, as, as Gary said, I mean, those those type of footprints, those customers in the, in 15 years ago, there were lots of companies. You know, there were lots of colo, small colo customers. There was caged areas, there were small suites, there was dedicated suites. So there was a lot of mix in terms of who were in those buildings 15 years ago. If you now go back to them, you're getting an extra. You know, you're getting a revenue from all those companies today that are there. But if you go back to them now and say, look, we have to do a major refit here. Uh, it's going to cause some disruption to that. That gives them an opportunity of looking at their current footprint. What can they do with themselves to reduce it? And then that will have an impact in terms of what your revenue is going forward because they're looking to take less in a new space that you're retrofit because clearly they'll use new technology. So that has an impact in terms of, of what your future earnings are going to be and how do you fill that gap? So it is when do you take that jump? When do you decide, you know, this 15-year-old plant, I definitely cannot continue putting Band-Aids on it. I need to take it out and do it. And how evasive is that going to be? How much trouble is that going to cause our existing customers and how many of them are going to leave because you know they're now looking at either this is going to make them the decision to move to the cloud or this is going to make the decision for them to reduce what they have technology wise and, and, and take up less space then once you've developed the new space so i think what i'm hearing what i'm hearing is that is that a lot of what a lot of these decisions are driven by client demands and what your clients are saying to you, you know, and the move clearly to you, uh, as we see more and more high power computing and hyper converged infrastructure come into the market and more clients are dependent on it. It's driving perhaps the need for retrofit uh, in, in nearly every facility. Is, is that fair? Are you seeing that, Joe, in terms of the, the work you're doing? Yeah, of course. Um, 
<laughs> it's probably one sector um, in in construction for us that cost is probably uh, the least important issue in construction. Um, you know, uh, it's all about program. It's all about uh, delivering a certain uh, engineered product. Uh, and cost doesn't come into the same level of focus as it would in other sectors. So if you look at residential and those type of projects, we would value engineering those two within an inch of their lives before they went to construction, whereas um, data center is different. It's all about getting the resilience right. It's all about getting the engineering design right. Um, and that, that's been that's been an issue that the cost, I, I see looking kind of five years in, a, in ahead of ourselves, cost will come into much more focus uh, and build an efficient, uh, really efficient facilities will be will be the future of this as margins get tighter, particularly around the leasing piece where Eddie touched on the point of, you know, it's all about the customer and what the customer wants. Um, operators are signed into 12, 15 year leasing. Um, there's no incentive in that piece to to improve the efficiency within the facility. Um, but I, I, looking ahead five, seven years, I think it'll, it'll come very, very sharp into focus. Um, but these facilities have to run really, really efficiently. And so upgrade and making them uh, totally sustainable for the future is what it's going to be at. Um, and we're all going to have to focus on it um, going forward, I would have thought. Okay. Okay. And I think uh, maybe moving on, uh, well, obviously on the same theme, though, and Frank, can I direct this question to you? Should developers consider upgrade of critical power infrastructure components in a retrofit, such as transformers, cooling systems, generator sets? Your view of that? Well, I think that that's one of the first places we need to look because when you do do a retrofit, you're in most cases also looking to increase capacity. So you, so you need to increase your energy savings, first of all, in your cooling systems, which in many cases, when you look at the big chillers, they are quite often direct online and there's a huge savings potential on those. So, but, but then when you do that, you need to look at the technologies you apply to make sure that you don't distort the power quality inside the building because if you do that you get heating on the cables you get heating on your transformers you potentially get malfunction on the gen sets once you need them if they're not rated correctly so so, so the power structure review is, is important but you need to you need to look at your cooling system because that is the one place where you have an opportunity to actually generate extra savings that does not reduce any capacity. Uh, on the contrary, it gives you more room to increase your IT capacity with the power that you save. And thereby you can scale up at, 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 and make it more reasonable in a retrofit situation. In a, in a new building, it's an entirely different scenario. Of course, you, you build the most optimum IT system because, uh, and then you, then you design the cooling at the lowest possible energy and lowest possible energy load relative to the IT capacity that you need. But in the retrofit, you've got, you've got a fixed existing IT capacity that you need to sustain. You have increases that you want to add. And then you need to look at how can I add the cooling? And you can actually also increase cooling with the existing system without adding new cooling systems by overspeeding to some extent the existing units. So, so there are some opportunities of increasing flexibility also on, on, on that to allow for some scalability. Excellent. Gary, any comments on that? Um, Brian, I, I suppose after just coming off the back end of a two-year retrofit of a live data <laughs> center uh, and aging quite significantly process, yeah. Um, so yeah, so here in here in here in City West, we 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 did just not, not so much the, the in fairness, not so much the generators and the transformers because they obviously have a longer life. Yeah. Um, but the, the entire electrical infrastructure in terms of the UPS systems, the structural and the overall cooling and the technologies used. So you, you know, one of the things we looked at when we were doing this was was not just about not just about the equipment, but also how we were going to operate it for the next 10 to 15 years. So, you know, your, your own operating efficiencies, you know, how we run the facilities, you know, we got, you know, where previously we had different cooling here in City West, we had different cooling architectures, one on the ground floor, one, one on the first floor. You know, it's about standardizing that technology as well. Absolutely. And to deliver those operational efficiencies. So. So, so yes, it, it, it can be done. Um, you know, we have to keep keep going, like I say, because you know, 
after this retrofit, we're looking, we're looking to gain another 15 years. You know, the, the building's always going to be here. So obviously a longer life scale, a life span than what's actually within the facility. Mm-hmm. Well, going back to what Eddie was saying earlier, it, you know, it really does depend as well where your customers are in their old digits, uh, in their digital transformation um, roadmap themselves, you know. So, you know, that drives the technologies that you're using. Um, and from an, an intrusive point of view, um, you know, that also drives the technologies that you have to use uh, yeah, yeah. within the buildings. Okay. And Eddie, is your, I mean, in terms of uh, looking at uh, the critical infrastructure, such as the large ticket items, such as transformers and potentially revamping cooling or standardizing, as Gary has just said, given he's had two different cooling systems in the same complex, I mean, uh, how important is it to, to look at the total cost of ownership of your existing operations and then move, and then justifying the capital spend of potentially large ticket items to get to a new place, to get to a new, uh, a new mode of operation with a new, well, uh, new, newly fitted facility? What's your view of that? How important is the total cost of ownership comparison? Yeah, I mean, it goes, I mean, for ourselves, the only thing that we've ever been able to sort of... Uh, salvage have been the gen sets you know um getting them re- zero rated and, and getting them uh, reconditioned etc but i mean I, I looked at 30 year old generators and i was toying should we or shouldn't we and i believed at 30 years they probably have had their life you know um yeah, yeah. Uh, because they were used these were used uh, at a lot more frequent in terms of top of the cost of ownership i'm not sure that's the right matrix you know it goes back to you know um you know no more than you know gary clearly with keppel and ourselves my shareholders we have to we have to put a business case in front of our, our client uh, our, our boards, and we've got to either you know know that the mark is there that customers will come, or we've got to show a client. In our, my case, I've got to show that there's a client there, so I am able to draw down the capital to actually do the fit out. So the the the, the cost of ownership is um, you know uh, we're always looking for efficiencies. We we keep a very simple system in terms of our design. Uh, so, so we're very consistent in terms of what our price per megawatt is to, to fit it out. Uh, but it goes back to that 10, 15 year contract with the customer, making sure then that is, you know, the, the client type is correct in terms of any funding we uh, draw down on. Um, and it's, it's, that's more important than anything else. You know, uh, the rest of it, Joe said, there's buildings out there, there's power out there. You'll find a solution. You've got to get the client first. You've got to find out where they want to be. Uh, if you're doing the type of business we're doing, um, if you're doing what Gary's got, where well, you've already got an existing real estate and you've got existing customers in it, and you can, you know, retrofit the building to provide new, clean, fresh space, then that's opportunities based on what the market requirements are. And Gary clearly, we're capable of being very successful in producing those, you know, those those customers to his buildings. So it it is all about the client. It's, and, and I keep saying that. I've said that to all my people. I say it to all my staff. I say it to all my analysts. Don't worry about the, lo- the location. Don't worry about the building. It's about can you get a customer to be there because okay. they're not, you know, that, that, and that is the driver. So Absolutely. the cost of ownership is, is all based on what your per megawatt uh, price will be for, for fitting out. And Joe and, and his team will tell you that down, as he said, you know, he can engineer that, engineer that right down to the last euro in terms of what the requirements are. Uh, because the shed is there, the building is there, so there's very little capital in terms of the, the physical shell, and all the capital is in terms of cooling, UPSs, transformers, and generators if you've got to replace them. And they're so, fairly fixed. So, Joe, thanks, Eddie. So, Joe, in terms of, and Eddie makes a great point, going back to board for approval of budget to make the capital spend. I mean, in terms of of, uh, of preparing that documentation and the justification of the, the business case and the business model to undertake a retrofit, where do you see the most important co- uh, components of that exercise to be? Uh, well, look, I think that the total cost of ownership is is a cr- is a key kind of metric. So if we look at the initial capital cost for any retrofit, it's it, it's 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 a it's a drop in the ocean compared to the total cost of ownership. Um, and key to any kind of executive decision making is having good visibility on what 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 the operation costs what. What is you know it, it's it's a key metric in in the whole assessment, um, and it would be great to see in the future that comes more into kind of balanced against uh, metric in, in leasing and, and, and that type of thing. Um, uh, it's, such, it's such a critical it's such a critical figure. So if, if we look at maybe the retrofit that we did in City West, the cost 
the total cost of ownership was probably three to four times the initial capital cost of the of the retrofit. So it's a huge figure, a massive number, uh, and it needs it needs a lot of consideration. Um, and it, it, it's it's not it's not hard to do it. Um, uh, you know, we we can get the metrics on it fairly quickly. Uh, we look at the kind of the key uh, the key components, break it down uh, system by system, uh, and and it's very very clear where where the real money is is spent over time. Uh, so it is it's it's a really really important factor that needs to be uh, needs to be considered. Um, and it's it's for, for a retrofit. I think it's it's critical. It's probably one of the main decision makers on why you would put in the initial capital investment is that you're having such an improvement on the TCO uh, and the, t the, the improvement on TCO typically is paying for the initial capital investment, if that makes sense. Uh, well, do, yeah. uh, Frank, Frank, what's your view of it? Well, I mean, it's the investments are always right. I mean, you, you need to, you need to really understand the, the full, the full scope of the project. It, it, it's, there's a lot that goes into it and, and, evaluation of what you have already is really the first key when you look at a retrofit and that's what we do get all the time is what 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 is the, what is the equipment that's already there before we even start touching anything because it, it, that that becomes then the key for what where are the right places to make the first investments right it, because there could be things that are relatively new and actually work well and with minimum effort you can bring it to the right place. Sometimes it's also just a matter of the fact that the way the controls are implemented, you don't get the savings you were supposed to. But the system in itself is actually quite okay. So, so then you look at optimizing control strategies instead, maybe changing sensor locations because while well, someone put the sensors right behind the pump, now you've got some cavitation and the measurements are actually unstable and then you can't control anything. So, so, so a full a full view of what's in place, what's impacting the current energy usage, and then looking at where are the right places to start. And, and the advantage of that, of course, is you can you don't have to necessarily run a big project. You just need to plan a big project, and then you can run it as increment, incremental upgrades without disrupting operation. So, so that's where I see the big benefit. It, it doesn't have to be a huge initial cost. We can run it as operational cost, if you will, and then, then then integrate it into your maintenance plans. When you have shutdowns anyway, then you use that time also to upgrade uh, at the same time. So so, so really looking at a, a, at a mixed bag of, if you're at a critical state where you need more quickly, then of course you need to, need to do a big implementation quickly and, and potentially have a short shutdown. But in most cases, if you do an incremental upgrade, then you can actually get a lot of benefits uh, with, with reasonably minimal effort. Okay, and so and so, Frank, in terms of the the uh, the main elements of the retrofit, um, you've so elect, we have electrical infrastructure. We'll be looking at cooling systems and control systems. Uh, how important is it to do is it to take everything in the mix uh, rather than taking some major components in isolation? You feel you need to look at the entire operational and the entire uh, infrastructure of all critical components? Well, what I always look at first is I look at the applications. I look at the actual cooling systems. And, and in that sense, the first point I look is at the chiller because that's typically where you have the biggest potential for savings. Then I look at how is that operated and I, I look at an evaluation of what could I do based on the load cycle that I have for this data center? What is the value of adding maybe variable speed instead of on-off control and slide valves, where can, how much can I gain? And then build a case for that and then look at the auxiliary equipment around it and then expand to the rest of the system. Then I start looking at the power system and looking at what are, the, what are the impacts when I start making these changes. Then I go into the power system. But for me, the first key is the application because that is what, what impacts the directly the operation of the existing installation. And then looking at once I make these changes, what would, what would the impact be then on on the on the power system, and and do I need to make upgrades there before actually I'm able to do the upgrades on the application level? And then I, then you then you sort of have a plan that that encompasses everything, but you you need to take it from from where the the key impact on the operation is first, and then look at what are the impacts of making the changes before you actually start executing. 
I see. I see. Very good. I, I think I, I think you're missing a, a critical component there, and that's the customers. Because Gary will tell you that the clients will buy one thing and they'll use something completely different. So, I, I and unfortunately, you're you're talking with your 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 HVAC hat on there, uh, Frank. The reality of life is a lot lot different, and Gary will tell you that because compute and uh, and what the customers do is completely di different to what they buy. Um, and 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 you know so. The cooling is the biggest killer for us to try and balance it. We do, we do a beautiful job of, of taking a room and commissioning it exactly as, as the contract says and as the customer needs. And then the client arrives in with a rack and it's going to do 12 kilowatts. And, oh, by the way, you're only supposed to be doing eight. Yeah, I won't use eight in the one beside it. I'll use four in there. And so, yeah, it, it, you know, and, and then you've got to go back and try and, you know, keep everything there. Cooling, yeah, cooling is the biggest challenge we have, um, and, and, and I hear what you're saying in terms of there, but if there's a data center today running that it hasn't got variable controls or hasn't got it, then it needs to re really look at its maintenance and, and what it's doing, uh, because by now, those sort of small things we have, within the industry we should have fixed. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot tougher out there than, uh, than, than just trying to, to regulate the cooling, but it, and it is our biggest bugbearer, you know? Yeah, I think, I think what one thing there, uh, Brian, and... <laughs> as I eloquently put it there, the customers, right? Is, is, uh, is, by the way, I, I meant that with passion. I love them. <laughs> but, but no, seriously, you know, anything we do, we have to think of uh, the impact on, on our end clients. Yeah. Um, and any journey we go on, on any efficiency journey we go on, whether it's a new data center or whether it's ret retrofitting a legacy data center with live clients in it, you know, it's a partnership approach. You've got to bring, you've got to be in tune with your end clients. You know, you've got to bring them on a journey as well because, you know, there are, there are a lot more things than just swapping out the UPSs, swapping out the cool, right? We then, you start to move up the stack into, into the controls and then the applications that we apply across the data centers. And, you know, we're looking at, you know, calling software optimization you know, within the facilities, how we maintain that, the cause and effect of, of making any changes uh, within the facility. You know, and going back to what you said earlier, Frank, about, you know, the, the, the planning is key. You know, you, one of the things, you, you know, the cause and effect of making a change in the live environment, whether it's, whether it's maintenance, whether it's, uh, whether it's replacing equipment, is key to anything you do because that has an impact on the end client. But then selecting the technology, the technology that you're putting in, also requires your clients to work with you. For example, let's say, and I know, I know it's old hat now, but you know whether they put in simple things like cold out containment, blanking panels still, you know where, where the end client sees a value of just doing that. Today, in, 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 in a, you know, we're, we're given when we go out and buy a new, uh, we've got to build a new data center, it's given it's got high aisle, high aisle containments or cold aisle containments, whichever way we design it, right? You're then looking at a legacy data center with clients that are already in situ that, in some cases, may not even have the racks in a hot aisle and cold aisle um, setup. So, you're looking at how you actually swing equipment as well to generate the, 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 the let's say, the return heat um, back to the, the top of your cracks, for example, you know, to drive the efficiencies that you've designed in day one. So, you know, you really do have to engage right at the beginning of the planning with your customers and, and bring them on that journey and allow them to understand what you're, what you're about to go on. Because without, without the end client, you know, the pro project's doomed to fail from the beginning. So, so, so you make, make a very good point, Gary. And can I ask you then on the back of that, how, how invested are, do you consider your clients are in the technology, in the design, in the innovation, as opposed to what the bottom line is? In fact, potentially the CTO reporting back to the CFO and the board and saying, fundamentally, uh, our IT systems are secure. They're functioning and working uh, as you would expect them to be. Our clients' customer satisfaction is at a high level, and therefore we're only interested in the bottom line, as in what it costs us to host uh, that equipment and have it fully managed and a full managed service uh, uh, offering. Uh, or do you consider that they're getting more under the under the hood, as it were, and they want to understand how you're doing it, 
or are there are, are there are more customers just interested in the cost and the level of efficiency that the of the hosting service that you're providing uh, no i think i think the customers are looking at it uh, com uh, completely um, from okay. from the design and bought into the design because you know if we're not upgrading our data sense from 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 the off you know you, you're getting into life cycle and failures um, in terms of failures of critical planet obviously that then starts having an impact on on the end customers um, so you know they're looking at the longevity of, of, of where they're going to be uh, hosting their equipment um, you know with you know people can depend on where they are again within their own digital uh, digital transformation stage uh, whether they can actually migrate away as I did uh, they mentioned uh, earlier um, but then again from a, an energy and a cost perspective you know, when we're doing these retrofits, you know, the mo all data centers pass through their energy costs to the client, right? And it goes through. So you're going to see a, dr a dramatic decrease nine times out of ten in in your energy costs that your that your end client uh, is going to be paying on the, on a monthly basis. So they'll see that financial cost. They'll see the security in the new infrastructure that underpins their IT infrastructure. And you know, like I said earlier, that that starts right at the big, very beginning of the project. So the the CTO fully understands this, uh, you know, the journey. That, and and it's not something that you can just do overnight. You know, the 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 the, the project here, for example, in City West took took two years. Yeah. yeah. And and when you're balancing um, your 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 customers across site everybody's everybody's got different aspects whether you know they, they, you can't maintain or you can't change on certain days so you've got to align all, all the customers at the same time as well which, which is challenging so more and more the the, the customers are obviously clearly aware of uh, all aspects of the service that the data center industry is providing is what you're saying it's uh, they're aware of the technology Everybody is, is obviously more and more focused on reducing carbon footprint and being environmentally friendly. And we'll come on to that in just a moment. So what you're saying is that it's important that all aspects of design, development, refurb, retrofit are combined with the end, uh, uh, the end goal of high performance and cost efficiencies. Um, and, if it, sure. and on the back of that, if I could bring in Joe, Joe, in terms of justifying then, we talked about total cost of ownership justification and talking about the, the end client, and Eddie uh, makes the point very well that it is all about what the end client wants and and satisfying them. How often are you seeing the necessity in a retrofit to uh, to to identify where there's redundancy, where there's uh, capacity, there's there, there's a room for consolidation, shall we say, where we have a lot of uh, uh, old equipment and uh, equipment that is uh, typically not as efficient as modern equipment. How often do you undertake large inventory uh, discovery, that type of exercise to say, listen, you've got 20% of your servers there could be could be done away with immediately for uh, for for more efficient uh, use of the space that you're that you're occupying. Shalk and Discoveries have been involved in, in several projects around uh, Dublin on project management and, and QS side is uh, just uh, I suppose what opportunity is within various data centers around Dublin uh, that's untapped. Um, there's an awful lot of data centers that have big power supplies and no customers in it, um, or the option of, of, of power and no customers in it, uh, and they're perfect villains for, for, for data centers. And we've seen a lot of that. Um, and I suppose great experience kind of crawling around City West and, and, and getting that that kind of uh, where there's inefficiencies within the existing uh, infrastructure and how you can how you can improve that. Uh, there's an awful lot of there's an awful lot of um, uh, seeing what the systems are currently doing, looking at kind of uh, what what is what it's doing from an operational point of view, and then looking at how you can improve it uh, through various systems. Um, with maybe some of the discoveries of City West is around the the, the architecture of the infrastructure. Um, I suppose what we've seen. Which is kind of on the shocking side is uh, that, that that data centers are designed for one use for one life span, uh, possibly just for one lease, and it's a fairly short lease in in many cases. 
you know, seven to 10 years or something like that. And it's only designed for that one, that one. Uh, and it's such a waste because what happens at the end of that lease is plant either needs to be retrofitted. Uh, it's, it's very rare that the lease would just fizzle out. Um, you know, a retrofitted is needed at the end of it. And it's really difficult then to, to uh, retrofit the infrastructure because it's designed for one life. Uh, and it's created a huge problem for data center operators who step into data centers that are seven or 10 years old. They have a huge problem on their hands that the, the design of the infrastructure is, is not capable for, for, for retrofitting it easily. So you have to do these deep grade uh, retrofits, uh, which are extremely risky. Um, you know, clients are taking, like Eddie and Gary, taking huge risks onto their own head uh, to, to satisfy a customer uh, agreement um, and to, to retrofit a facility. Uh, and it's 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 a fairly stressful experience, and that could be all simplified by designing for longer uh, use. Uh, it's simple enough to get the infrastructure uh, right day one um, with with the opportunity to 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 uh, change out plant and equipment more easily in the future. Uh, it's the way design has to go, um, and, it, and it hasn't been like that in an awful lot of facilities. Or certainly, a lot of the facilities we've seen have been designed for very very short lifespans. So, so you, you bring me on to a very good point, actually, uh, Joe, which is, uh, and I think address it to everybody, really, uh, um, is that what are the, uh, and there'll be lots of our participants, lots of our audience, members of our audience today who are sitting there thinking, will we under, will we embark upon a retrofit uh, in our existing legacy data center? Should we do it or should we not? And, and it begs the question, what are the major constraints? What do you all consider the major constraints of, of embarking or commencing upon a, a retrofit of a facility? What are the big, what, what's the big blockages? What would be the, the major challenges to such a retrofit exercise? I think, I think Brian, again, th that depends on, on, on what you retrofit. Um, so to, to be fair, so, you know, if Eddie's retrofitting a, a, a shell and core that, you know, He's, he's obviously going to be looking at spatial considerations, um, and no, and no different, no different for an existing facility. You, you know, one, one of the things, one of the big challenges we looked at, you know, when we were looking at the cooling technology, for example, um, that we were going to deploy here, was, you know, the spatial constraints around the building, right? Where, where was uh, and the location of the building, the orientation of the building. Um, and then the sort of technology that we could actually implement that were that drove or that was least intrusive within the facility. So you know, if you look at a new data center build where you know let, let's just try out X cool units, fresh air, air handling units, right? Um, doing fresh air, you know, are they um, are they ideal for for a retrofit and? Um, not really in, in, in quite a few cases because internally you've got to make so many structural changes um, that you have to change the complete internal structure of, of your, your building and potential uh, your potential customer layout within that within that area. So that that's one of the big things that you've got to look at. And then again, the technologies that you're going to put from an electrical point of view. Do, you know, are you just going to are you, are you just going to replace light plant? This was one of the big questions that we had when we started the project. You know, you can go and take out one block UPS and put in a new block UPS. You know, are you going to drive any efficiency any efficiencies from that? Are you going to improve your facility from from a, a security and a resilient point of view? You know, and it's all these sort of questions that you need to ask yourself. Um, and, and you know, driving the least impact for your end client. And, dry, and, and obviously the risk and eliminating or mitigating the risk of any potential impact from downtime while you're doing this work as well. And, of course. And then any intrusive uh, work from, you know, you, you can't just approach these as a construction job, you know, yeah. it's a yeah. lot of yeah. no facility. So <laughs> you've got to have a completely different mindset from day one when you're approaching a, a retrofit of a, of, a, of a legacy data center. You know, the yeah. doors aren't open and, and you can't just stroll it in out on a daily basis. Yeah, there's so, so many, many things <laughs> to consider. Eddie, go ahead. 
And, and the other challenges as well is that, you know, 15 years ago when we were putting in raised floors, you know, we were doing the best we could in terms of what the loads were of the, the, the server racks. Today, when you get customers, you know, pulling in a big storage device or some other piece of kit that he wants to have in his row, uh, the floors typically aren't able to take that. So then yeah. you've got to reinforce the floors all the way through there, and you know, and and, and they become challenges. And then it's, then there's the then there's the, the next thing. If, if you've got existing underfloor cooling, and they bring the rack that's going to be pulling twelve kilowatts. You're going to struggle to get that for it, that, that existing plenum uh, to, to to try and you know cool that rack. So there's all the things that technology, because of the the density the racks are doing today, are mm -hmm. causing those legacy footprints. For ourselves, we try and remove the raised floor because we know the load and we know the fact that you know we need to look at another solution for the typical or the traditional, I should say, uh, underfloor cooling. Uh, so filling the, the the whole room itself, and then as Gary said, containing the art pile. But then you've got a customer sitting beside that new rack, and he's got an old Cisco that's blowing the, all the air into the, you know, this, this re reverse blowing. So you have all these challenges, you know, because the guy yeah. just ordered the wrong, you know, he ordered the wrong part, you know, model number, and it's the, the air's blown in the wrong direction, you know. So there are all the challenges that having that mix of of, of uh, new fit out and old new customers and and, and uh, existing customers, they're they're all the challenges and the balances. I, I've worked on four live data center fit outs. Uh, okay, and uh, I, I got to the stage in my life now. I'm too old and too great to be doing any more. So, uh, God bless Gary. Um, he's more than welcome to to doing what he's doing. Um, and they're not easy, you know. And they're never easy. And 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 uh, it, it is it is protecting the client, protecting your SLA because that's what your revenue is, you know, going to be targeted against. Um, and and making sure that everybody understands that this is not a construction site and and getting everybody there. And it's a it's a ch it's, it's a challenge. It's tough. And men will be men. You know, the biggest, the best guy in the world will always look for something to to make it a little bit easier that day when, you know, he uses a drill without any dust protection and that goes in the server and you've got customers then that uh, are down. Yeah. They're the simple things, you know. Um, and how do you mitigate that? You, you go into a live environment where you've got your crack unit still running and you've got to run new pipe work for, you know, fire suppression or whatever. And the floor underneath is just blowing and bellowing because the that's the air plenum, and you've got to drill into that floor, and you've got to stop that dust going. You know, yeah, yeah. Hilti, Hilti's great, but they're not that good, you know. So yeah. you you have to come up with some mechanism to do that, you know. Um, so you know, they're they're the, the practical challenges in terms of the retrofitting and the problems you get on a on a daily basis. And it is a, it is a minefield. It is a minefield. Yeah, yeah. Well, conscious of the fact, as I said earlier, of, of those in the, our audience today who are who are contemplating a retrofit, I do want that that we present the that it's it's such a minefield and such a great uh, monumental task to do it that they shouldn't consider it because. No, clearly, Gary. Gary, we've got yeah. some lovely space in Kepler now. It's all ready to go. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, for, for Brian, to be fair, it is a minefield. It is, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You can't change not, that. No. There's no, there's no two ways about it. You, you, you can't come into a retrofit in a day center with your eyes closed, yeah. right? No. It, it is a complete and utter minefield. You've got to think of everything from start to finish. You've got to plan it. Um, you've got to roll it out. You've got to make sure it's no different, like what you're doing on a, a daily operational basis with with your your method statements, rams, and so on. But you have to actually go a, a damn sight deeper than that and look at the complete cause and effect of what you're going to do in that data center. From you know, even you know, your your customer swapping out a hard drive. Okay, I know that sounds crazy, but if you're going to be putting in new and you pipe work under the floor, can that customer in an emergency get to his server to replace his hard drive? It's not all about the, the M and E. You know, it's the it's the impact on people coming to your site because you can't close the doors and say, yeah, no, no. come back in two years when we're finished. Yeah. You know, that's that's impossible. Yeah. And, and, and going to what Joe said earlier, I mean, we, 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 we have, we've all, you know, the industry itself has changed its design for those retrofit things there. So, you know, in our, in our last design, in our last building, we, we, we put service corridors. So, the, you know, that mitigating circumstance where we have an engineer with a tool roll on the floor and he's sitting there with a floor tile up trying to do something to a compressor or whatever at a crack unit in the data hall is gone. So we try to mitigate that, but there is some services that you can't mitigate. You need, you know, fire suppression. You need uh, smoke detection. You need leak detection. You need certain things that are always going to be, um, you know, in the in the data hall, uh, one way or the other. So there's certain things you can't do, but you have to try. And Joe said it there early on. You've got to try and mitigate 
the risk and the design needs to be such that if you want to retrofit, you can do it without impeding uh, the major part of the works. Absolutely. So having service corridors, moving the moving the IT, sorry, moving the mechanical and separating it from the IT, 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 it makes life so much easier in yeah. terms of dealing with the client on, yeah. on a daily basis. It doesn't make it easy in doing, doing the work. I'm never, ever taking that away from how hard that is. But it just makes that one problem in terms of your mechanical and electrical engineers interfacing with the client, trying to change a hard drive, trying to do, take a delivery, trying to do whatever they need to do to keep their business going. You need to try and, you know, and we're doing that with it by, by you know, making sure anything that's on the uh, mechanical electrical sits outside the space. But you can, only do that, you can only do that when you've got a blank canvas. Right. You, can do, you can only do that when you've got an empty room. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. The well, I think you can have is the legacy data centers. How do you how do you take that outside? How do you make that service corridor? Yeah. And then nine times out of ten, you can't. And nine times out of ten, Gary, you can't even swap out your crack unit. You're going to have to completely uh, rebuild your crack unit in place because, by the way, you've got no room. weren't big enough in the, in those days. We only had six hundred wide gaps. You know. And I think what we're highlighting here from from what you're saying is that there there really are two profiles of of retrofit. One is where you have a a, a data center that's at capacity that is overdue a, re, a, a refit, a refurbish, and you have a, a effectively either a, an empty facility or very low capacity facility that would, for example, have a, a large amount of swing space to accommodate yeah. a phase a phase retrofit. And there will be those in the audience today. Who have who are in both those uh, both those uh, areas, uh, and that's important to know that the retrofit is different for each. Maybe Joe, you want to comment on that? They, I'm sure you've been involved in in both scenarios. Yeah, we have. Um, um, uh, <laughs> looking at kind of some of the older facilities, like when when they came together, um, uh, there's some bizarre stuff actually in in, in data centres. Um, you know, they were, they were built in a different area. They were built for primarily for banking and telcos uh, early days and um uh, the, the, you know a lot of the infrastructure was put in uh, some of the sites that we've seen just sea containers um filled with equipment um you know and it's put together around industrial units um and, and changing that out is 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 a huge task you know um and it's, it's not even possible i suppose what we like to do is kind of look, look ahead as opposed to look you know what's what's gone before um, and, and I think the future of this is 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 uh, now that there's much volume in, in data and that we know where it's going, which is it's going hyperscale, it's going uh, large scale builds in the future because uh, the demand is is such. We we have to build infrastructures that suit that, um, and and uh, I suppose there's going to be huge pressure now on building sustainable infrastructure, uh, sustainable critical systems. Uh, that that don't uh, guzzle uh, energy, um, and it's 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 a very significant challenge. I think if we if we kind of control all delete what's gone before, and start with a new mindset, um, uh, then 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 we build better in the future. Um, for us looking at projects, it's 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 all about kind of Gary touching on there. It's all about the project planning. It's all about uh, retrofits are are not traditional builds. Um, you have to read decouple the whole supply chain in my opinion uh you need to get close with all, with all your supply chain so all your providers so you need your uh, electrical uh, switch gear guys at the table on a direct basis you need your uh, ups guys at the table on a direct basis you need those guys to crawl around your existing facility on their hands and knees and see what you have yeah. um, and really understand that we're about to get into and bring that whole partnership of suppliers, contractors, client, everyone, project manager, everyone together. Get your uh, team together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we're going to come yeah. on to that uh, actually very shortly, Joe. If I may, though, uh, before we get off the subject of critical infrastructure and and uh, the profile of the facilities, uh, Frank, if I could put a question to you, and we did it, yeah. we did touch upon it when Eddie talked about um, you know raised floor and. Uh, weight constraints potentially of large storage systems and hyper converged infrastructure that are that are, we're seeing more and more now in the in the market today uh getting a specific design detail where you see for example a raised floor and so many legacy facilities come with raised floor it's the way it's the way they were built what's your view of that moving from raised floor to to everything overhead in a retrofit i mean what is your 
view of that, and why would a why would any any of our, our audience today considering that would 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 decide to move to a, a totally overhead facility? Well, I mean, if you if 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 you're doing a retrofit and you you you're in an existing operation, then then moving to to overhead instead of a raised floor is a lot more challenging because it will disrupt operation. I mean, you can't really remove the raised floor without having some level of disruption of operation, and whether or not you can allow that, even uh, that needs to be considered first. If you can't allow that, then it's not an option. It's a no go. You need to continue with what you've got. But, but I mean, there are some advantages, and especially as Eddie mentioned, I mean, some of the new racks, they, they're just heavier and, and the raised floors just can't carry them. So you have the option of reinforcing the existing raised floor, which, again, is a, a big task and, and challenging because you're in a live environment. Whereas if you can if you can remove the raised floor, then you don't have to then then you still have the disruption. But you have a much more solid and future proof foundation for it because the new technologies are are moving more towards the overhead cooling rather than the raised floors. And you've also got the, the liquid cooling for, for, for some of the server rack, which again, doesn't require the raised floors. And then you have, again, also more room space to, to deal with that when, when you don't have that. The advantage of the raised floor, of course, is that, that you, you have a good distribution and, and you don't have overhead uh, that you have to worry about. But, but it does it does have some backdraws when when the weight suddenly changes to what you had planned for and that of course if you've got a concrete floor it's a lot more flexible in that in that regard i see and and you, is it the case that you're seeing more and more in terms of of new build and uh, the latest uh, and innovative designs that more and more uh, data center operators are moving to to all overhead and no raised floor well, you're seeing much more decentralization in the cooling as well. You're seeing much more cooling move into into the aisles, essentially. So, so, so with that, the need for the raised floor also disappears because you don't need those large air volumes moving around because most of the cooling of the rack itself is actually done within the rack almost now. So, so, so I think we'll see. I mean, we just saw Microsoft uh, pulling up a, a data center from the bottom of the ocean. Um, talk about liquid cooling. <laughs> so, so a lot of things are happening, right? Uh, where we're going to be in five, ten years from now, I don't know, but, but we are definitely seeing uh, seeing some trends in, in that direction. Hyperscaling will probably still need a level of of centralized cooling as well, because there are other concerns as well uh, that that you need to take into account, and you you need to have some level of redundancy if if you liquid cooling that is more directly in the service doesn't provide necessarily what you need then then you then you parallel uh, to, to have have a lower risk of, of operational disruptions uh, and that consideration will probably remain okay Gary what's your view of that uh, near on impossible in some <laughs> cases don't go there don't go there uh, yeah so just look at it if, you, if you've got <clears throat> if you've got a, a, a co-location room full of of IT equipment how are you going to remove the raised floor the one, the one thing that you, you could potentially do, but again, it becomes disruptive to a degree, is you could install your power overhead. Um, but then again, you've got to bring your customers on journeys because they've then got to have to look within the rack and within their own PDUs and change the change the way, you know, you, you're getting closer to the rack. Yeah, you're reducing uh, the dependency on the raised floor. Uh, absolutely. We're, we're, in, we're in nine times out of ten a, a retrofit of, of a legacy data center that has existing clients. You want to try and stay as far away from the rack. I know it sounds crazy, but as far away from the rack as possible. So you know how Good point. You know, how yeah. deep you're going into into that retrofit. So for me, um, you know, changing the, 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 the cooling technologies under under the floor. There could be pipe work. You know, there could be electrical infrastructure. You know, if you think about it, you then got to raise the whole IP equipment, strip out all underneath the floor, and drop all the racks onto the floor. It's just, it's not going to happen. Not unless you you're going to take everybody out and close the doors for a couple of years. As as Eddie Eddie said earlier, you know where where he's highlighted or located Shell and Core legacy data centers that are empty. That's possible. Um, you know, if you've got an empty co location room. Then you could oh, look it's it. possible. Do it by do it by data hall, data room. 
Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, again, but then you then you're potentially changing your cooling technologies. Yeah. Uh, so you, you've got to look at your your whole business model once again and say, you know, right at the very beginning, lay out what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, what, are you, what are your objectives? Uh, uh, absolutely. So you know what you you know exactly what your targets are at the end and the the market that you're going to be uh, targeting. Um, and, that, and that brings me on to another point in terms of what our audience uh, are, are, are seeking to achieve. And one of those may well be those that are very conscious of uh, of the environment. Uh, they want the facility, they want their entire IT operations to be more environmentally friendly, reducing carbon footprint. Where where do you all consider the, the opportunities are in a retrofit to, to satisfy those client aspirations to, to uh be more environmentally friendly, Joe. Well, I suppose uh, been working in data centers for the last ten years and seen a lot of lot of change. But one of the big changes was, you know, clients, um, customers' demands. You know, that the base was run at kind of twenty twenty one degrees, and now that pushed to twenty eight twenty nine. Um, you know, if customers and clients focus more on what can they live with and how can we get the technology within the data hub to. Uh, to to absorb those heat uh it, it could be huge in how the infrastructure is designed um and that might be part of the solution of of making uh, these facilities more environmentally friendly um and frank touched on the point of you know the you know data centers moving into uh you know undersea and all this kind of submarine type uh, data centers um you know and that, that, that probably is the future of it you know that's where um you can get efficiencies within the design of the infrastructure and that's the whole point of doing it because it's, it's cheaper and more environmentally friendly uh, and we have to look at that in building design um you know what, what are the metrics of the facility and how can we how can we improve them through design uh, to be more uh, sustainable and more environmentally friendly uh some of the kind of uh, things that we've achieved um in in, in recent years is is just around the efficiency on the cool and that's 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 what kills the environment on the environment on the environmental side of these things um and improvements in you know not cooling these facilities at the same level and moving to fresh air where we can um these are all kind of big ticket items in the in the operation on getting these facilities to, uh, uh, to a position that's that's carbon neutral um new technology coming on online i've seen something recently there um carbon mechanical carbon trees which take out carbon and, and <laughs> uh out of the environment so so we have to look at everything it has to be a blank canvas uh we have to be open to uh, trying new technologies we see it in in car manufacturing uh, they're, they're trying they're testing it works it doesn't work you have we have to sample uh, we have to see what's working uh, and there's no one better place than than co-location providers to do this uh, to, to trial and sample um, technologies. They have a little bit more of a kind of a a, a free run. Uh, out of, you know, they're, they're risking maybe their SLAs and all that type of stuff. But they have they have more opportunity to look at design maybe than than, than, than fixed operators. Um, but we have to have an open mind, or we're just going to we'll come to exactly the same position in, in seven, ten years time, which is not acceptable. Gary, what's your view of it in terms of the, the environment? And it's obviously very topical at the moment with power consumption in and around the Dublin area, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, how can it, yeah. That, that, those, those numbers vary all depending on who you talk to, obviously. If you yeah, yeah. watch dispatches last night, Mr. Bitterlin said, I think his numbers were 41% actually um, on dispatches last night, which I thought was quite crazy. I'd love him to uh, substantiate those numbers. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but yeah, the 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 sustainable sustainability aspect and the efficiencies that are driven using the newer technologies are key. Um, you know, as I said earlier, you know, you, you're looking at the, the metrics, PUE metrics, you know, carbon usage effectiveness on the site, driving all that down. You know, one one of the things that that's always been a challenge for for any of the data centres. You know, when you get into into contracting at the end, you know, clients want X amount of power. Um, you know, and this is this has been a long term problem for for any operator, as as you, as you well know, and whether the clients actually going to use that. 
that power. So you have it sat there waiting for it to be potentially used. So then again, looking at the technologies, and again, it's, it's all done with technology, but putting in modular systems that can actually meet and grow, uh, meet and grow with your customer demand from a power perspective, therefore reduce, uh, increasing your efficiencies on site. You know, for a retrofit data center, okay, we're never going to get, well, depending on the orientation of the building, you know, it is highly unlikely that you're going to get fresh air cooling um, because of the intrusive nature of the work. But there are technologies out there now that will use free cooling uh, quite a lot more, obviously, in the environment and looking around the building to say whether you can get the volume of air through um, and so on and so forth. So, you know, everything that we do and that we have done and in our planning process is all about how we achieve you know that the, our sustainability targets as an organization as a group you know and we have that laid out um, uh, across across the team so it's not you know we put the equipment in that's fine how we manage it how we operate it how we get the best out of it to drive the best efficiencies uh, and 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 drive a, a drive our sustainability program is is key for everything we do um so it is a challenge um it is a challenge it always will be a challenge and you know we'll always have those people that you know are out there saying you know data centers are, uh, are, are the number one enemy now on on the infrastructure um so you know we're all aware and we're doing as much as we can to make them as efficient and as sustainable as as possible sure frank what's your view well i mean Sustainability is quite often talked about, but in, in most cases, it's talked about in the sense of energy efficiency. But energy efficiency is just a very small part of sustainability. Reuse is actually the most sustainable way of doing anything. Uh, what Joe's been talking about is take an existing building that has some existing infrastructure and build there rather than starting from, from a greenfield then you're reusing existing already built buildings. And what's more sustainable than that? In the same way, when you look at a, an existing running data center, looking at the equipment, well, maybe some of the legacy data centers were using IE2 motors because that was state of the art at the time. Well, then you can get IE5 motors in the same form factor. So just replace the motors. Now you've got an energy improvement. But also look at what types of motors are you using, because some of the first very high efficiency motors are, are rare earth permanent magnet motors. Well, there's a mining issue with the rare earth magnets, which means that the material used in the motor is actually not that sustainable. From an energy efficiency point of view, yes, they're very sustainable. They're IE4. Great. But looking at the whole sustainability around it, you need to look at where's the material coming from, Child labor is being used to mine minerals for rare earth magnets. That's not an, a sustainable practice. We need to look at ferrites. We need to look at high efficiency non-magnet motor instead. So, so I think we need to broaden the discussion around what is sustainability rather than keeping it narrow-minded on just the energy efficiency. The other part on what we've been talking about is power quality. And, and essentially, when you've got a lot of electricity, in the building, it's non-wattage energy use that the utility has to generate. Well, we're not getting penalized in most countries for having non-wattage use when it's harmonics. We offer displacement power factor. Well, why we're not getting penalized for using power inefficiently? We should be to become more sustainable and have more investments in reducing the noise that we generate, which causes issues for the power utilities. So, so there's a lot more aspects to it than just yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> narrow-minded energy efficiency on the component level. Okay, okay. Well, I'm conscious uh, of our time, and I'm conscious again of our, our of our audience and, and their expectations. And one thing I want to come back to, and Joe mentioned it earlier, was putting having the right team together. So let's assume that we're uh, that we are um, we've we've agreed the objectives. That everybody's agreed the objectives and what they want to achieve out of a retrofit. The total cost of ownership comparison has been done. The justification has been made. The business case has been made to the board. So let's talk now about the actual project planning. Then we're 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 getting into the to the to the amber light phase of the project, ready to to, to get to green. 
how important is is project planning uh, in all of this? And Eddie, you're just back. Uh, I know you had an important Apologies, call yeah, to make. Adam. Yeah. That, that, uh, so, Eddie, in terms of project planning, uh, in, in any of these retrofit projects, whether it be a, a a large capacity, full, almost full data center, or it's a it's a, a building that's going to be retrofit, how important is project planning? It's 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 uh, it's the most essential part. It's 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 day by day, hour by hour, depending on how deep you're into the customer's domain. If you're in the in, if you're physically working in the data hall itself, then it's hour by hour. Um, if you're working outside the the hall, then it's day by day. If you're working a bit deeper, then you know any changes. You know, so it it it, it all it, it the project plan is is essential. The risk profile, you know, the cause and effect of what you're going to do. From the very beginning, you, you can't underestimate how much you've got to think and, and look at the risk. And the most important thing is rolling back. If I do this and something happens, can I get back to there? So in other words, if we disconnect that cable and it turns out there's a piece of equipment that hasn't been mapped out that's on it, how quickly can we get that cable re, re, you know, connected back you know, uh, before someone's cut it and it's too late then? So they are all the things you've got to look at. You know, the other thing is is, is that when you, you know, unfortunately for myself, I, I I worked on a project where it was a very very old legacy data center. We never knew any, who was in there before, and when we start removing panels, uh, so we programmed to to do certain aspects of work. But when you remove panels, um, we found out that uh, the, the workload was a lot bigger because you know the people had bypassed the, you know certain breakers and had done things which were making the whole thing very very dangerous. It, it's it's just a case of um, of uh, you know, and that changes your program because then you've got to go back and you've got to reassess then how you're going to do it. So you've got to sit down and you, you've got to work with your team and you've got to work with your customers as well. As I say, the deeper you get into it, the worse it gets. You know, and the yeah. fire, fire 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 alarms and the fire um, systems going off are the biggest biggest headache in retrofits. Mm -hmm. You're you cannot underestimate how many times. Uh, in the older facilities where you've got old cabling that you've got to replace because of um, clips that are now fireproof and things like that, you know, tie wraps that were put on and, and all those sort of simple things that people don't think about, but there's a, a huge cost to them, but a massive, massive problem of alarms going off and just touching the cable and, you know, just they're, they're the challenges that you have. Um, and, and I've never been on one that you don't have, you know, you, you don't have heartaches. I had a, I had a generator go on fire after being retro after having a, a, a getting a generator recommissioned. Somebody decided to leave his glove on top of the uh, exhaust and then put the insulation and everything on it. And then we fired up the generator and the bloody glove went on fire. You know, so mm -hmm. yeah, you want to you want to be in a you want to be in a generator room when that happens. <laughs> exactly. So uh, Gary, what about you in terms of project planning, having the right team together, and very importantly, contractor selection because that's going to be. Uh, top of the list for so many of our uh, uh, members of our audience today about how you actually kick this off. What's the, what's the, in terms of uh, the first thing to do? What's the what's the top of the list? Surrounding yourself with a good team. Mm, absolutely um, right. Um, from after, so you know, not jumping into it, not not picking up, going through a, a firm and strong tender process, um, looking at your designers, your project managers looking at their experience, have they done it before, you know, the teams that they're going to be put in, putting in place. Uh, these, are, these are all key because you select the wrong people, your project can overrun 10 months, 12 months, you know, it could be significant more costs involved um, and, and constantly reviewing that. Um, I think one, one mistake is getting it off the ground is, is, is the hardest part, obviously, but constantly reviewing how are you getting through on, on your planning? Have you got the right people, the right skill sets? You know, is there any attrition within your team and what impact that's going to have on, 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 your, on, your, on your plan? But the couple of things I would, you know, from, from experience, always expect the unexpected <laughs> in, in, in one of these buildings. Um, never rely on any old documentation or drawings, okay? Because as Eddie quite rightly said, there might have been a, uh, an engineer that, or an electrician that thought he was doing the best thing for the data center and, and just, you know, bypassing something that you didn't know about behind the panel. Um, you know, so, you know, the planning and, and getting those people in place is key. And never under, and you can't underestimate the amount of time and effort um, and stress and strain it puts on your existing teams. Okay, from an operational point of view, and I've got to say, you know, over the past couple of years, we've out, 
about the the operations team and what they've done here you know it it, it was it was challenging and it very time consuming on top of your normal bau so when you're looking at your planning and your project management you must take that into account so Absolutely. It, it's not just about getting the right contractors the right project managers the right qs's yeah you, you know um you've got to look at your existing team are you resourced up enough yeah. with your existing operational team to actually cope with the additional uh, time and pressure that's going to be put on them over a large period of time. And I think all of us would agree that, um, certainly from my experience, and I, I know your collective experience, uh, gentlemen, is is correct documentation. You, you, you mentioned it, Gary, clearly. Uh, and so often uh, records aren't what they should be or change control management systems aren't what they should be. And so often we don't know what the exact inventory is. We don't know, do we have proper cable mappings, that type of stuff. All of those things are so important. I think I think it is good that we maybe send a message to all of the audience that those are the things that you need to tidy up and, 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 and have up to date in expectation uh, of, of a retrofit coming down the line because, and those, that documentation is essential uh, no matter no matter what you do, your clients want to see it, uh, and uh, I think Joe, uh, get back in terms of the project planning. Uh, are those? Do you find that uh, records, documentation, uh, and the the C CMDBs are they in are they in good condition? Are they up to date? What's your experience and what you've seen over the years? Yeah, that's right. It's a great point. Um, I suppose maybe step back on one point is uh, with these projects. There's, there's no place to hide. Um, you know, if there's any weakness on the team that you put together, it becomes very, very evident very, very quickly. Um, you know, so if there's a weakness in your engineering, it just it, 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 the thing falls apart very, very quickly. Um, so, so it's probably a, a unique kind of project in in many ways. In that, you know, when new builds, you know, disciplines kind of cross cover each other. If that makes sense, or trade on site cross cover each other. But it's nowhere to hide in these type of projects. Uh, so all disciplines have to be, including the client, everyone has to be, uh, everyone has to be great. Uh, the, the record documentation, it's, it, it's really important, but I think what's more important is the, the engineering design uh, day one, that there's sufficient time, and this is what can happen in construction, is sufficient time to design, to engineer, to uh, plan the project sufficiently to deal with the type of problems that we experience when we're going through the process. Um, documentation is really kind of, from maybe from the point of view, is just make sure that we we're, we're covered commercially as we're going through it. But 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 really that it's it's designed so we, we take this maybe existing information, see where there's gaps in it, and then put on top of that a new design, a set of documentation that's going to represent the project that we're about to, to embark upon. Uh, and that's the real challenge with this is because you need a lot of time to to to, to design a retrofit. Uh, you need a lot of project planning. Um, I think we were about a year in the project planning uh, up in City West. Uh, not, not many commercial entities have time, uh, that type of time, uh, that type of resource uh, availability to put into the pre-planning of a project. Uh, and what we see more often than not is we just head into projects and we hope for the best and, and we try and cross cover each other um, and, 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 you know, uh, client picks up. So you, you, what you're saying is you, you really need a really good integrated team and everyone knows what everyone else is doing. And a really good, uh, solid project plan. Yeah, exactly. You, you don't need many people, but you need the right people. The right uh, people. And if you have the right people, the right team around you, uh, then you have a much, much better chance of, of success. And it's a little bit like you know, Eddie's point there. If something simple happens, you, you need everyone to react uh, at, at, at pace uh, because it needs the customer in that space and uh, very, very significant penalty that they could build up. You know? and can I just say, as we. Sorry, sorry, Eddie. I was just going to say the, the one thing in Ireland that we're blessed with is that we do have a, a, a great choice of of, of, uh, of people within the industry who understand the asset class, you know. So absolutely, between absolutely. Dawn and Engineering great, great and Mercury, great skills and, uh, based. Yeah, we, we've got great great contractors. You know, Joe Joe clearly and he's, he's, he's cut his teeth and doing this. And there's other companies out there like Linesight and and, uh, and uh, you know Kirby Engineering for doing MV. So you know, the, the Ireland is blessed in terms of, of what its skill sets are and what it can deliver, um, and and that's that's pretty unique across Europe. Uh, and these guys are finding that when they go to those countries, that they are outperforming anyone locally. So Indeed. Uh, you know, Indeed. so so we, we we're very fortunate. We've got a great workforce there. 
Exactly. Uh, and, and Gary said, getting the right team. I'm, I've been fortunate enough. I've had the right, the same group of people working for me for the last seven years uh, on, on projects, you know. And, um, so and, that I, continuity. Lucky, and it's that continuity. And, 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 and in many ways, they understand the, the client as well and how awkward and, mm -hmm. and uh, obstreperous I can be as well. So in many ways, it works both ways, you know. Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm not the easiest to get on with. My wife will tell you that. Um, and so, you know, it has to be that balance, you know, uh, us as a customer and a client and, 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 our, and the team that we put around us, you know, uh, there needs to be a balance on both sides. So uh, that's not always easy. That's, that's a valid point because what, one of the things, you, you know, on, on, on a new build, conflict, man conflict management is a challenge on a new build. You're taking that to a whole new level yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so it gets a lot, heat, a lot more heated in some aspects. So it's, it's as to Joe's point, it's, it's kind of step back, you know, reassess and move forward again because, you know, what you're thinking you're going to be doing tomorrow, right? On your, on your plan, you know, you've got everybody lined up. Actually, do you know what? Um, a client might have an incident within his own environment. That stops everything. Yeah, stops all work, and then you've got to swing the whole team to do something else. Right? Indeed, indeed. And, and you know, all that then builds up, especially with the trades that don't understand, so, or some of the trades that don't actually understand, you know, what rep that actually means. You know, in in a live live environment, the management structure might you've got to try and get that education all the way through the entire team. Um, to to get that understanding and prevent as much conflict within the project as possible. So, yeah, so I, I mean, that, that's very true. I'll just tell you one small story. We, we, we were working for a high street bank, uh, sorry, high street uh, retailer in the UK, and we, we uh, were pitching for um, retrofitting their existing data center, moving their bank, moving all of their, 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 their back office to this new space. And we were competing against two of the largest data center operators in the world. Uh, they were part of this presentation panel that was uh, had to come in and do the pitch. Uh, I arrived with 12 uh, of a team, everybody from our Dornans who were doing our, our mechanical, electrical, our designers, Ethos were there. Um, we had uh, the people who, uh, my engineering group that were going to do the, the the uh, taking the servers down and doing all of the clients migration, they were in the room and they just, you know, so every question that was asked, there was someone there who was able to answer the question for the client. Fantastic. We should never have got the project, we should never got the contract because of the size of our company and who these were and who our competition was. But they said the other two large companies were so big. Yeah, but that'd be fine. We'll deal with that. We'll deal with that. There was no confidence that these two sales guys who were pitching for the work we're going to be passing it down operationally for them to deliver because of the complexity. And they just didn't have that. So as Gary said, it's important to have those people there. You've got to have everyone there that's, you know, the last fellow who's going to pull the last cable out to move the client's gear to the very person who's going to be designing at the beginning, you know. So it, it, it is that, that, that full spectrum that we had to have. Um, so, and unfortunately for us, they got into financial trouble and we never picked the, the project up. So. Yeah, well. So I think overall, I think, and, and for the, again, for the benefit of our audience, and maybe to sum up, I know we're we're sort of coming to the end of the session. I think what what I've what I've heard uh, up until now is that is uh, you know why do you want to do this for someone anybody considering retrofit? Why do you want? Why do you need to retrofit? Why do you feel you need to retrofit? Do you have? Can you justify the cost of retrofitting? Uh, is it essential? Is it necessary? If you're going to do it, make sure that you uh, you identify if there's any constraints, what the blockages are, if there's anything that might prevent you embarking on your retrofit program, and then moving on to understanding exactly what your current state of your infrastructure is today. I think which is we're very which is very important because without that, you're just going to extend and lengthen the time it's going to take to do a good project plan mm -hmm. and to do a proper design. And then obviously, you know, if, if you're going to go ahead with it. Uh, I think what I'm hearing is, you know, do the project plan, get a really good team together. Good contract selection is so important. And as we've all, like you've all articulated, there's a great skill set in Ireland today to be able to undertake such retrofit programs as we've discussed. And uh, those are all very, very important. Anybody like to add anything before we, we finish off? Yeah, be sure you want to do it. 
He should have a good, good, good funny guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. These, these these projects are not impossible. We're not here to put anybody off, Gary. I think we're here to no, say I, that. If, you, if we, you're going to retrofit, it's possible. It's doable if you get the right team together and you get your objectives and your in perspective and in, in the proper oh, order. No, absolutely. It is. And, and don't be afraid to do it. But again, yeah. it depends on where you are and what you're doing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you've got if you've got a, a 250 kilowatt data center, on-premise data center, do you really want to go and retrofit that? Or do you really want to go and outsource it? Have you got a 10, 15, 20 megawatt data center that's 15 years old and you've got existing revenue? Well, yes, of course you're going to do it because one, you want to protect your end client, uh, protect your revenues um, and, 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 and keep that data center within your own portfolio. And then thirdly, like, like uh, as Eddie's doing there, he's, he's going out and and retrofitting legacy data centers with, with no clients in so and that's his business model and um, so yeah never be afraid to do it it's just that you know what what are your objectives what you know what what you're looking to try and achieve at the end uh, as the end game so but just be prepared for what you're about to take on and don't underestimate the size of the project because i think that's a mistake people underestimate the size of a retrofit project and then are too far in and, and, and just look back and say, what, what have I done? You, you, you do have to do it. These buildings won't continue to operate without some form of retrofit, uh, without yeah. retrofit through the whole life cycle. So. Could I just, just before we finish off, there are a couple of uh, uh, questions that have come through in the chat, which I think, uh, uh, and uh, we've won from Anthony Milovansev, I think. He said, what kind of PUE reductions can an upgrade get within reasonable CapEx limits? Uh, you know, he's talking about can we get from a PUE of two, you know, is it possible to get that down to 1.5 or or, or, uh, or lower in an older facility? In other words, what, what's reasonable uh, ranges to, 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 to aspire to to see can we can we achieve? Yeah, well, you can, you can is the answer. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, a reasonable capex, is, well, it depends on the size of the, <laughs> the size of the data center, really, you know, what you're calling reasonable. Um, but getting down from 2.2 .2 to 1.3 maybe even less uh, again is achievable but only achievable if your end clients come on the journey with you right so we can put in as much efficient plant and machinery as you want or mechanical electrical equipment as you want to deliver that and design it but your your, your clients have like I say your client has to come on the journey there's no point in doing that if you're not going to put in cold hours you're not going to put in blanking panels you're not going to drive more efficiency you're not going to allow the temperatures to be raised from 21 to 24 or 26 degrees okay so there's, there's a whole a whole aspect uh, to that. what do you see about that frank have you have you in it well yeah i mean uh, first of all i mean the lower you want to go the more it will impact your existing operation so, so you need to know how how risk adverse is the client because if the client is very risk adverse, then there is a limit to how low you can get because you need to have a certain continuity uh, of operation that is required by the client. Uh, and the other thing is, every time you look at a retrofit, you always need to have two scenarios. What is the next best alternative to doing what you're planning to do? And doing this assessment on, is it really the right thing? And have that dialogue with the client saying, we can do this, what you've asked us, get to 1.3, but this is the consequence. What we could do alternatively is this, and then we only get to maybe 1.6, but it's still better than where we are today, but you would then not have these specific risks. So, so always have, a, have at least two scenarios so that you understand the differences of approach and where you can get to with a reasonable effort. But there's, there's also the, the other thing you've got to do is bring the customer along as well. I mean, I, I've, I've come across a situation down here in Malta where a client is still looking to go for 19 degrees in the cold arc. He's looking at, tech, you know, he's looking at ASHRAE figures that none of us, are, the rest of us are using. They're looking for unrealistic numbers in terms of their, um, and th th there's no, ch th you know, there's no ch changing the, the, this customer's mind to the extent that we've walked away from that particular client. We okay. won't be able to support them because we're looking at 24 degrees because, you know, I think uh, Joe said at the very beginning, we, we've got to look at the sustainability of what we do. 
and we can't deliver that and then try and get customers in who are looking at more sustainable approach and, and trying to deliver the same thing. So it's extremely hard to, 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 uh, to, to find the balance when you've got a multi co-location uh, data center with all exactly. your customers. Very, just, very one o- just one other question. Actually, Barrett asks, are we looking forward to seeing more growth in new build or retrofit? What, what's your view? Maybe, Joe, is that, do you have a view on that? Oh, like we, we, it's a very positive message about retrofitting in, in that um, it saves a fortune for for a client, you know. Um, so you know you're retrofitting at maybe two or three million a megawatt versus a new build, which could be five, six, maybe seven million a megawatt. So a huge, huge saving in the bottom line. So it's it's a really positive thing to do. Uh, the difficulty with it has has plenty of challenges. So you need a team that's really, really up for it. Um, so um, so I suppose. Uh, we we would strongly promote it uh, under certain kind of very clear conditions that you know it's properly engineered. Uh, the uh, tender process. There's a clear project management that sits on top of the whole thing, and they're they're highly experienced in dealing with that. Um, and that the client expectation, the customer expectation, is properly managed through the process <clears throat> in terms of how, how it's going to how it's going to materialize uh, on site uh, as 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 the work is done. So it, really positive thing to do and then it has huge carbon savings um just touching on the original point which is you know new buildings guzzle uh carbon you know and it's it's a huge huge problem for the construction industry to deal with um you know and this is a very very simple uh pollution in many ways uh that is sustainable good message i think data centers are going to come under serious pressure from the media in the next few years um you know the media is going to hang on to this until it's, until it's dealt with um you know what data centers are, are doing in terms of of of, of uh their environmental they're an easy target as well kind of easy to get data on. i think uh you know time just to make really really positive steps and this is this is one very significant step that, that, that the industry can make um uh without, without a huge stru- structural shift in what they're doing okay okay <laughs> Well, gentlemen, I think we've had a very, thank you all very, very much for your contributions. It's been uh, very, very interesting to hear from all of you uh, uh, and, you know, industry experts, each one of you, uh, great experience uh, throughout the years in the, in the data center industry. And uh, I think it's uh, it's been a very, very lively session. We've had a lot of questions. We can't unfortunately take them all, but uh, uh, thank you very much. And hi, Hugh, I hope... Uh, you enjoyed the the contributions and the exchanges and the, the discussions. I, I found it fascinating, and, and as a as a salesperson, it reminds me of the seven P's process. Proper, properly planned preparation prevents piss poor performance, and um, I, I think that 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 has come through. It it's all in the detail. It's all in the planning, and um, what Gary and uh, Eddie have been saying, and Joe and everyone about beware be ready for the unexpected um but i think joe you make a, a huge point about it has to be environmentally friendly going forwards it has to be the way to go and i think i thank you would just like to thank you all for your time for your insights uh, and for your humor so uh, on behalf of data centers island thank you all very much brian sterling job and um, we look forward to doing it again hopefully live at data centers island next year absolutely you always a beer you <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got some. I've got some alcohol-free Guinness. <laughs> Good, <Yeah>. great. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Kirsten will shut the room now. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.